Hello, I'm Rachel Callanan, the Clerk Assistant Procedure with the Department of the Senate, and welcome to, de to today's Senate lecture, the first in our series for 2022. I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, and pay respect to their elders past and present. Today's virtual lecture is being live streamed on the Australian Parliament House website, and it's also being Auslan interpreted. After the lecture, if time permits, we'll do a short Q&A session. In the absence of an audience present in the room with us today, you're welcome to submit questions via email to research.sen at aph.gov.au, and we will aim to get to them at the conclusion of the lecture. Just to repeat that email address, it's research.sen at aph.gov.au. Now, I am very pleased to introduce to you Ben Oquist and Bill Brown from the Australia Institute to present today's lecture. Mr Oquist and Mr Brown will share the findings of their recent research study into Australians' knowledge of and attitudes towards the Senate, which they detail in their co-authored report, Representative Still, the Role of the Senate in Our Democracy. The report was launched in May last year by the former president, the Honourable Senator Scott Ryan. It provides a valuable source of quantitative data on and insights into contemporary understandings of the Australian Senate. Ben Oquist is a long-standing policy analyst, commentator and political and communications strategist. He joined the Australia Institute in 2014 and was appointed Executive Director in 2015. Bill Brown is the head of the Institute's Democracy and Accountability Program. His diverse areas of interest include the use of opinion polling, truth in political advertising reforms, and the role of the states and the Senate in Australian democracy. Would you please welcome me in joining, in welcoming, <laughs> would you please join me in welcoming Ben Oquist and Bill Brown, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Rachel, and uh, thank you to the Department of the Senate. Thank you to all the, the Senate staff, um, and in particular the, this lecture series. Uh, it's a great honour, actually, to be presenting here today with my uh, colleague, Bill Brown. The Australia Institute's um, passionate about the Senate, and I've certainly have been passionate about the Senate most of my adult life. Uh, I've taken that uh, passion for the Senate, its workings, its power, its responsibility, its policy and political opportunities to my work at the Australia Institute. Um, I've worked in and around the Senate for the best part of 20 or 25 years. Uh, so it is a particular honour um, to present uh, this, be part of this lecture series. Um, uh, and if you indulge me for a moment, a, a career highlight actually, as somebody who has recognised um, and appreciated the role and, and the importance of the Senate in our democracy, uh, has been an active participant in Senate uh, policy debates, uh, a keen watcher of this uh, lecture series, and interacted with many um, Senate players, participants and workers over a long period of time. So thank you to the Senate Department, thank you to the Senate, thank you to everybody who works at the Senate and, and makes it tick, um, from the committees to the procedure office to the table office to many other aspects of the Department of, of the Senate. I, I know how important uh, your work is. I have appreciated it firsthand over many years. So as I said, a, a particular honour to be giving uh, this Senate uh, lecture today with my colleague, Bill Brown. Uh, thank you for your introduction, uh, Rachel, and all your work too. Australians are confused about the Senate. That is the unmistakable conclusion of the Australia Institute's national poll of Australians on their knowledge of and attitudes towards the upper house, the largest and most comprehensive poll ever taken of its kind. However, that does not mean the Senate is not important to, not important in the public's democratic engagement. In fact, the Senate, with its unique powers and proportional voting system, could be key to restoring the electorate's diminishing faith in our democracy. In the face of long-term loss of trust in government 
and an increasing appetite for secrety, secrecy and executive power, we want to make th the argument in this lecture that the Senate remains the best hope for a saviour of our democracy. Today, we'll examine the power, proportionality, diversity and possibilities embodied in and by the Senate. First, I'll give a short word about the Institute and how we work. Uh, I will introduce the broad areas we plan to talk about today and take you in detail through the results of our polling. Uh, well, Bill Brown will take you through the, the detailed results of the polling about Australians' knowledge and attitudes um, in the Senate. Bill will take you through the origins of the Senate's powers and the effects of proportional representation on its makeup and activities. And a, a lovely quote from uh, former Prime Minister John Howard there, which I'm sure you'll all enjoy. And I will come back at the end with what we, can be, what we believe can be done to strengthen the Senate and thereby our democracy. The Australia Institute is one of the country's most in influential uh, public policy think tanks. We employ about 30 or 40 people uh, with a keen interest in democracy and accountability ever since we formed back in 1994. We're based right here in Canberra, physically as close to Parliament House and indeed the Senate as we can be, just a stone's throw down the street in Manuka. In recent years, we collaborated with um, anti-corruption campaigner Tony Fitzgerald to put out his four principles to politicians ahead of a Queensland election. We've made the case for truth and political advertising laws nationally and saw them legislated right here in the ACT. And we've founded the Democracy and Accountability Program within our organisation last year to research the solutions to our democratic deficit and develop the political strategies to put them into practice. The program's first major paper was Representative Still that Rachel just discussed called Representatives Still, a collaboration between myself and our Democracy and Accountability Program head, Bill Brown, who you'll hear a bit more from in a moment. The paper finds that the Senate is a unique, powerful legislative body, but Australians are confused about key details of its powers and operation. The paper was launched by Scott Ryan, then President of the Senate and Senator for Victoria, and a champion of the role and power of that chamber, uh, and he launched that on our webinar, webinar series, and do tune into that uh, after you finish with uh, this webinar. At the outset, I want to note the great debt uh, that paper owes in this lecture um, uh, to the Papers on Parliament series. By my, 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 my count, our original paper cites 15 articles from the Papers on Parliament series, as well as Senate monographs by David Hamer and Stanley Bark, and numerous reports and briefs by the Department of the Senate. We very much stand on their shoulders. Crucially, our polling research adds quantitative data to the discussion. This lecture series, this lecture explores for the first time what Australians as a whole do and do not know about the Senate and its implications and, its, and the implications of those results for our democracy. At first blush, Australians are confused over even basic questions about the Senate. Our research reveals they see distinctions between the Senate and the House of Representatives that are not there, wrongly answering that ministers must come from the House that senators and MPs are paid differently and that question time is not held in the Senate. Only three in 10 identified the House is green and the Senate is red. I'm sorry you're not here to see that we're standing in a lovely red room here. The public's shaky understanding of the Senate is in spite of its importance to our democracy. Unlike some upper houses in other Westminster style democracies, our Senate is active, powerful and crucially representative of the public. As a well as a legislature in its own right, the Senate is a house of review of bills, regulations, government administration and policy. It also exercises accountability functions like ordering the production of documents by the government and conducting estimates processes where ministers and senior public servants are questioned. The founders wrote into the Constitution a Senate, not a State's House, with almost co-equal powers to the lower house. 
Unlike conservative other upper houses in other jurisdictions, the Senate has always been elected and with the same franchise as the House of Representatives. Since proportional representation in 1949 was introduced, the Senate has been more willing to exercise the powers bestowed upon it by the Constitution. Proportional representation makes the Senate a diverse and representative body. The first two Indigenous Australians elected to Parliament, Neville Bonner and Aidan Ridgway, were Senators. Senator Bonner was appointed in 1971 and won an election in his own right in 1972. 38 years before an Indigenous Australian, Minister Ken Wyatt, would be elected to the House of Representatives. In our parliament, the first Indian Australian, the first Muslim woman and the youngest woman were all senators. Senator Bob Brown was the first openly gay man elected to parliament and the first openly gay party leader. And Senator Penny Wong was the first openly gay woman elected to parliament and the first Asian Australian woman elected to parliament and the first openly gay member of cabinet. And Bill Brown will detail a number of other firsts um, that have occurred in the Senate, we think largely due to its proportional representation voting system. While women were simultaneously elected to the Senate and the House of Representatives in 1943, the first female party leader, the first woman to administer a federal parliament and the first woman in cabinet with portfolio responsibilities were all senators. To this day, the Senate much better reflects Australia's gender balance than the House. Women hold 40, 40 of the 76 Senate seats, or 53%, but only 47 of the 151 seats of the House of Representatives, or 31%. At a time when women's role in public life and politics in particular is at the fore, it's worth reflecting that we're having big success in representation in one chamber in particular, and that's the Senate. And it's not dwelled upon enough in our public debate about women's representation in politics. The Senate is also more prepared to stand up to the executive arm of government than the House of Representatives. The most visible example is the crossbench, which has held the balance of power for most of the period since 1955, bar that exception in the last term of the Howard government, but party lines are also more fluid in the Senate. As Senator Barnaby Joyce uh, has showed, when he crossed the floor 28 times as Senator, it seems a lot, but he was outdone by Liberal Senators Reg White and Ian Wood, who beat him through the 50s and the 70s, who crossed the floor 280 times between them. But there's more. The Senate also serves as an important ideas bank, developing and advocating policies that will, in time, be taken up by governments. The legislation for same-sex marriage, for example, began in, the, began in the Senate, as has much climate legislation. The Hawke government saved the Franklin from being damned for sure after a massive protest movement, but only after the Democrats introduced and passed legislation in the Senate. Hawke would later adopt effectively adopt the legislation as his own. Looking further back, Australia owes its compulsory voting to a private senator's bill in 1924. With trust in government declining, the Senate is more important than ever. However, it needs to find its feet to fight back against efforts to stymie its powers. And that's the argument we want to make today. Answers to the legitimate questions of senators in estimates have become more evasive and derisory. The government's interpretation of public interest immunity bears little resemblance to the Senate's. Orders for the production of documents have been disregarded. Bills originating in the Senate are ignored by the House of Representatives, even though they would pass if brought on for a debate. The Senate has the tools to remedy the situation. Foremost among them is the one that is fundamental to its status as a co-equal legislature. The Senate can block the government's legislative agenda until the government accounts for itself. The Senate has used this power with success. For example, when the government wanted to pass, uh, uh, when the government wanted to implement the ethanol subsidy scheme in 2003, 
the Senate did not pass the relevant bills until the government provided documents relevant to the scheme. However, it is rare that, the, that executive intransigence is sufficiently challenged. Every remedy at the Senate's disposal depends, in the end, on the strengths of, it, of its will, and the Senate has too often balked. One comfort for the Senate is the evidence in previously unre uh, unreleased Australian Institute polling that we're putting out today that the Australian people back the Senate. Six in 10 Australians agreed that when the Senate had the and the government disagree on whether the government has to hand over information, the Senate should insist upon its interpretation. Australians may be confused about how the details of the Senate operate, but they expect it to be vigorous, powerful chamber that holds the government to account. Seeing the Senate hold the government to account would give the community renewed confidence in the body itself. Indeed, a stronger Senate could help renew confidence in democracy itself. And I'll come back to some of those themes later on. Meanwhile, I'll hand over to Bill Brown to take you through some of the detail of that polling that we've uh, I've just discussed. Thanks, Ben. In July 2020, the Australia Institute polled a nationally representative sample of 1,600 Australians on their knowledge of and attitudes towards the Senate. The results show that understanding of the Senate is relatively poor, underscoring the importance of lifelong civics education on the role of the Senate in our democracy. Australians assumed that the two chambers were more distinct than they actually were. When asked if government ministers must come from the House of Representatives, 39% of Australians incorrectly said that that was true, with only 24% correctly saying that was false. 37% chose don't know, not sure. Australians are also unclear on whether senators or members of the House of Representatives are paid more or if they are paid equally. 45% did not know, 23% said senators are paid more, and 17% said members were. Only 16% gave the correct answer that they are paid equally. Only 25% of Australians correctly identified that question time is held in both chambers with 34% thinking it was held in the House of Representatives only, 11% the Senate only, and 1% saying question time is held in neither chamber. There was also general confusion about how long the terms of senators for the states run. For this question, we did not give a don't know, not sure option, telling respondents instead to give their best guess. Only 15% gave the correct answer of six years. 5% selected none of the above, presumably suspecting a trick question. 27% chose until the next election, and 53% chose a year length that was wrong. As for one of the basics, what colour the Senate is, only 30% correctly answered red. Half of respondents knew that they did not know, and about 20% confidently chose a wrong answer. Finally, we tested people's knowledge of the balance of power in the Senate. We have now asked this question three times, most recently last month in preparation for this talk. Does, this, does the coalition government currently have a majority in the Senate? In 2018, 50% correctly answered that it does not, which fell to 36% in 2020 and to 34% when we asked again last month. The shrinking size of the Senate crossbench might contribute to confusion here. Overall, the results paint a concerning picture of the limits of the public's knowledge of the Senate. In conversations around our findings, we heard from many people that their political education was limited to primary and high school. Civics education targeted at adults is clearly needed, not just as a refresher, but also because it is when someone gets the right to vote that information on how our democracy works is most salient. There were two silver linings in the polling research. The first is that despite the confusion about how long senators serve, there is little sense that the Senate's electoral system is unfair. 
In 2020, we asked respondents which system they thought was fairer, the one used to elect the House of Representatives or the one used to elect the Senate. The most popular response was that the systems are equally fair, selected by 37%. A further 35% chose don't know, leaving 19% who thought the House system was fairer and 10% who thought the Senate system was fairer. Last month, we conducted a new poll asking Australians a related but more provocative question, whether the House of Representatives should adopt proportional representation. Today, I want to share these results for the first time. One in three, 34%, preferred the proposition that in the House of Representatives, a party should win seats proportional to the overall number of votes that it receives. More Australians, 44%, prefer the status quo, that a party should win a seat for each electorate where it receives a majority of the vote. In the absence of a concerted push for proportional representation in the lower house, I thought these numbers were impressive. On the face of it, one in three Australians prefer proportional representation in the house to the status quo. Of course, how that support would translate to enduring policy reforms remains to be seen. The second silver lining is that while Australians are confused about the Senate, they recognise its power and importance. We presented Australians with eight powers that the Senate may or may not have, and asked them whether each was a power that the Senate actually had. A majority, 56 to 59 per cent, correctly identify that the Senate can pass, reject or delay legislation from the lower house, whether it is a private member's bill or a government bill. More answered correctly than incorrectly that the Senate can propose new legislation and set up its own inquiries. Where Australians went astray was with three powers that the Senate does not have, to confirm or reject treaties, to confirm or reject government appointments, and to introduce tax and spending legislation. More Australians thought the Senate had these powers than that it did not have these powers. Australians' confusion about the Senate would be less concerning if the Senate were not an important part of our democracy. But the Senate is important in two key ways. It is a co-equal legislature with substantial, if too rarely, used powers. And its election via proportional representation means it represents people that the House of Representatives fails to represent. The Senate's powers have remained mostly unchanged since Federation and the Australian Constitution. Unlike many upper houses, the Senate has almost as extensive legislative powers as the House of Representatives. It is a good thing too, since the Senate is effectively the sole legislature, in the words of David Hamer. When we talk about reserve powers in Australia, it is the Governor General's powers we mean. But the House, and Rep House of Representatives and the Senate have unwritten powers as well, thanks to Section 49 of the Constitution. It provides, the powers, privileges and immunities of the Senate and of the House of Representatives and of the members and the committees of each House shall be as such as are declared by the Parliament and until declared shall be those of the Commons House of Parliament of the United Kingdom and of its members and committees at the establishment of the Commonwealth. It is from these reserve powers that the two chambers can trace parliamentary privilege orders for the production of documents, and the tremendous, though rarely used, power to fine and imprison those in contempt of Parliament. What would it take for the Senate to use those powers more often or more penetratingly? And while government is formed on the floor of the House of Representatives, the Senate, through its power to block supply, proved in 1975 that it has a kind of veto over the government, the power to force an election. The fallout from the dismissal demonstrates that this power should rarely, if ever, be exercised, and it is unlikely to be used again. However, this ultimate sanction protects and preserves the Senate's status and power. That the Senate has this robust role in our Commonwealth was the intention of the founders, who at the time of drafting had the UK House of Lords, the US Senate, and the Canadian Senate to draw on for their models. Alfred Deakin, a future Prime Minister, called the two chambers the irresistible force and the immovable object. Nor was the Senate ever intended to limit its scrutiny to state issues. 
the name State's House was debated and rejected in the constitutional conventions for the more general Senate. And the founders would have known from the United States example that senators have never limited themselves to protecting states' rights. Though the Senate's powers are pretty much the same as they were in 1901, its use of those powers has waxed and waned over the decades. The winner takes all electoral systems in the Senate before proportional representation led to dramatic swings with the government or opposition in control of the Senate in most instances. Knowing that a loss in the upcoming election was likely, the Chifley government legislated proportional representation ahead of the 1949 election. While preserving its numbers in the Senate was a motivation for the Chifley government, this manoeuvre also fulfilled the promise of the constitutional conventions and the expectations of the founders, and was a reform that both Labor and non-Labor politicians had argued for over the decades. Within six years of proportional representation, a consistent minor party presence emerged in the Senate, thanks to the Democratic Labor Party, followed by the Australian Democrats and now the Australian Greens. People still persist with the claim that the House of Representatives is the People's House and the Senate the State's House. Until the Senate is elected on the principle of one vote, one value, the House of Representatives will have a powerful claim on the title. However, the mechanism of proportional representation means that in many ways, the Senate is more representative of the popular will than the House of Representatives. John Howard observed as much in 1987, when there were Democrats on the crossbench amenable to opposition proposals. He said, the Australian Senate is one of the most democratically elected chambers in the world, a body which at present more faithfully represents the popular will of the total Australian people at the last election than does the House of Representatives. That is a fact in terms of the proportional representation system. It remains true today with then Senate President Scott Ryan observing in 2019 that the current Senate is actually very reflective of the national vote despite the differences in state populations. This popular representation gives the Senate a vigor and authority lacking from appointed or even worse hereditary upper houses. In 1873, well ahead of Australia's con constitutional conventions, Walter Baget observed of the UK House of Lords that being only a section of the nation, it is afraid of the nation. While mathematically, it's possible for senators from the smallest states to control the legislature, in practice, it is impossible. Senators are tied to their parties and to broader policy interests, not their states exclusively. The Senate's proportionality means it is more representative of class, cultural, and gender interests. Women were simultaneously elected to the House of Representatives and the Senate in 1943, but today women make up half of the Senate, but just 30% of the House of Representatives. And while the party system means that for the most part, a major party senator's vote does not vary no matter what state they come from, independent and micro-party senators are often more explicitly representative of their state's interests. For example, Brian Harradine and Jackie Lambie from Tasmania, and Nick Xenophon and affiliates from South Australia. The Senate has been a source of diversity, even though there are half as many senators as there are MPs. An explanation for this might be given by a profile of Penny Wong in the Sydney Morning Herald, which said, when Penny Wong won pre-selection for the Senate before the 2001 election, the joke went around that she would never have been able to contest a lower house seat, being not only a woman, but Asian and gay to boot. Hopefully, if that were ever the case, it is no longer true. And indeed, there have been people of diverse backgrounds elected to the House of Representatives. But it is true that proportionality means that a significant minority that is distributed across the nation can be appealed to in the Senate in a way that wouldn't necessarily work in the House. Diversity milestones set in the Senate include the first Chinese speaker and child of a Chinese person elected to Parliament. That's Thomas Backhap, 
elected in 1913 for the Liberal Party. Bak Hap was the adopted child of a Chinese immigrant and an advocate for the Chinese community in the face of the white Australia policy. The first two Indigenous Australians elected to Parliament, Neville Bonner and Aidan Ridgway. The youngest woman elected to Parliament, Sarah Hanson Young, although the youngest person was Wyatt Roy in the House of Representatives. The first Asian Australian elected to Parliament, Sabin Chen. The first openly gay man elected to Parliament and the first openly gay party leader, Bob Brown. The first openly gay woman elected to Parliament, the first Asian Australian woman elected to Parliament and the first openly gay member of Cabinet, Penny Wong. The first member of Parliament with a partner who is transgender, Louise Pratt. The first female party leader, Janine Haynes the first woman to administer a federal department, Annabelle Rankin, the first woman in cabinet with portfolio responsibilities, Margaret Guilfoyle, the first Muslim woman elected to parliament, Maureen Faruqi, although the first Muslim elected is Ed Husik in the House of Representatives, the first person of black African descent, Lucy Gashuhi, and the first person of Indian heritage, Lisa Singh. A powerful demonstration of the reinvigorated Senate is in orders for the production of documents. This broad power comes from the ancient privileges of the House of Commons, and it extends to the creation of documents that do not yet exist, not just the publishing of documents already created. In this way, as well as in scope and timeliness, it distinguishes itself from freedom of information requests. I think anyone who has put in a freedom of information request and often waited months or years for a reply which turns out to be unsatisfactory would envy the Senate its powers here. Orders for the production of documents are also a quantitative measure of the Senate's activity as a house of accountability. The first Senate was a prolific user of this power, but after the non-Labor parties combined into the Liberal Party in 1909, its use dropped off until the 1970s. It was not until the 1990s that the rate of orders for the production of documents returned to that of 1901-1906. By contrast, the number of bills considered every year had increased 10 times over in that same period. Thanks to a 1999 report by the Department of the Senate, we get a window on some of the documents that the first Senate, 1901-1906, was particularly interested in. Statistics on the death rates of white people compared to Pacific Island workers in Queensland, the Governor General's expenses, and any papers relating to the statement from the General Officer, now the Chief of Army, that Japan and China were casting longing eyes upon the northern portions of Australia. Times may change, but the Governor General's expenses remain of interest. In Senate estimates a few years ago, they were go going over a tender for the government house kitchens. Labor Senator for Queensland, Joe Ludwig, admitted he didn't know what a thermomix was. Committee Chair Corey Bernardi asked him where he'd been. Ludwig replied, Queensland. There are now almost 20 orders for documents with continuing effect. Among them, the Haradine motion requiring departments and agencies table a list of files, making, inf making freedom of information requests easier. The Murray motion requiring departments and agencies disclose high value contracts they have entered. The motion requiring Australia's national greenhouse gas inventory to be published quarterly in a timely manner and monthly reporting of vaccination statistics, one of the more recent orders. The Australia Institute is proposing a new standing order for the production of documents, following our research into the growing use of private consultants to do government work. The proposed order would firstly require tenders and contracts with consultancies to include information about the purpose and scope of the work, a kind of expansion of the Murray motion requirement, and secondly, require the government to table the final reports and written advice received from a consultancy. With such an order, the public would be able to see what research, advice and recommendations consultants are giving government and check consultants' reports for themselves to see if they make a convincing case for any action the government ends up taking. The Senate has also been the Parliament's ideas bank introducing good ideas, sensible policies and effective reforms years or decades before they are picked up by the government 
and the House of Representatives. To give just a few examples, same-sex marriage legislation and progressive climate legislation had their origins in the Senate, as did the legislation introduced by the Australian Democrats to stop the Franklin River from being dammed, which passed the Senate. The incoming Hawke government would end up adopting much of the legislation as its own. And an end to mandatory jail sentences for petty theft in the Northern Territory. But examples of the Senate's forward thinking can be found much earlier than this. In rereading John Err's biographical paper on Catherine Helen Spence, I was reminded that the original Australian electoral legislation was initiated in the Senate, most notably giving women the right not only to vote, but also to stand for election. The Senate's bill extended suffrage to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians, but the House of Representatives struck that part out. It wasn't until 1962 that that grievous wrong was righted. Likewise, we owe compulsory voting to a private member's bill from a nationalist senator, Herbert Payne, in 1924. Of course, in politics, the credit goes to those who get reforms done, regardless of who started them. But we can still treasure the Senate for its role as an ideas bank, proposing reforms that are treated as heresy until they become cornerstones of our system. And for the final part of our speech, I'd like to hand back to Ben. Uh, thanks, Bill. Uh, a, a great outline of, of many issues, not just uh, community attitudes to the Senate in, in a contemporary sense, as, uh, as Rachel mentioned, but also the, the, the diversity of the Senate, um, its uh, power, uh, but also as its ideas bank. And uh, as you can see, there's effectively several functions that the Senate is forming that are absolutely uh, key to our democracy and key to a, a flourishing democracy uh, and an active and engaged one. And it's something that's not reflected upon enough in our public debate. Having said that, the Senate is its own worst enemy. Uh, we've devoted a great deal of this speech to the argument that popular authority, thanks to being democratically elected through a proportional representation system, gives the Senate the confidence to act even in defiance of the government. But we've also seen the Senate's will falter. On matters of whether to censure ministers, question the government's claims of privilege, hold senior public servants in contempt for defying orders for the production of documents, or disrupt the government legislative agenda. In a 2018 speech, Senator Rex Patrick contrasted the Senate to the House of Commons, where a software company refused to hand over documents relating to Facebook at the request of a House of Commons parliamentary committee. The sergeant at arms was dispatched to bring the owner of the company before the parliament. When it was explained that he faced, that he faced fines and imprisonment, uh, where, where it was explained that he faced fines and imprisonment, uh, when another company was similarly in risk of being in contempt in the Senate in Australia, no such measures were deployed. The Australian Institute has some reassuring evidence for the Senate. In preparation for this speech, we polled a representative sample of Australians on what they think of proposition about the Senate's power and independence. Today, we detail those results for the first time. Seven in 10 Australians agree that the Senate should use its powers to make reports written for the government by private consultants public. Only 12% disagree. Six in 10 Australians agree that when the Senate and the government disagree on whether the government has to hand over information, the Senate should insist on its interpretation compared to 14% who disagree. 46% of Australians agree that the Senate should refuse to, ho to hold a vote on bills that the House of Representatives passes if the House of Representatives is refusing to hold a vote on a bill that the Senate passed, while only 27% disagree. It's this final example I want to linger on. Senate enthusiasts often talk about the Chamber's power to fine and even imprison those in contempt of the Senate. But using these measures would be polarising, 
and fraught if actually exercised, although as reserve powers they remain important. The Senate's power to hold a government business, on the other hand, not only has strong precedent, but it is clearly proportionate. We saw the Senate use its legislative powers to impose procedural penalties on the government in 2003-04. When the government wanted to implement an ethanol subsidy, the Senate had ordered the production of documents related to the scheme, which the government had advised multiple times that it would not do. The Senate refused to pass the bills until the documents were tabled. In a subsequent sitting, the government tabled some, though not all, of the documents and the legislation passed. Something similar happened in 2009 when the Senate ordered information about the national broadband network. The legislation only passed after the government produced a summary business plan. Similarly, the former MP and Senator David Hamer proposed in Can Responsible Government in Australia, finalised in 2001 and published after his death in 2004, that responsible ministers should front Senate legislative committees, even if they were from the House of Representatives. If the minister did not comply, in Senator Hamer's words, the answer of the Senate would be simple. The bill would not be proceeded with until the responsible minister has given evidence. As well as support for the Senate acting as an institution, there is even support for direct action by individual senators. Last year, Senator Rex Patrick named and criticised a senior public servant who had made an FOI decision in defiance of the findings of the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. Andrew Podger, a retired public senior public servant and former public service commissioner, sure known to many of you, has said that Senator Patrick's language went too far but that the senator was justified in naming the public servant and that the public servant's decision was almost certainly not justified and that the decision demonstrates the loss of expertise in and increased political pressure on the public service. The Canberra Times weekly survey asked its readers whether they thought Senator Patrick's naming and shaming was fair and reasonable. As the local paper of a public service town you might suspect the sympathies would be with the public servant. As it turns out, almost half the readers, 47%, thought Senator Patrick was fair and reasonable despite his controversial move. Only 36% thought not. In conclusion, the Australian Institute's polling finding Australians have a limited understanding of the Senate may not surprise, but it should make us concerned. It is a powerful argument for civics education, of course, but not just for school students, but in the form of lifelong education for adults as well. Australians' tradition of compulsory voting makes it even more important that every citizen knows what they're voting for and why. The Senate is a sometimes neglected but vitally important accountability institution. Its constitutionally guaranteed co-equal legislative status is a source of much of its power. But it is the Senate's election by proportional representation that gives it legitimacy and authority as well. The Senate has been the source of many of Parliament's diversity milestones, not to mention the diverse moments, interests and constituencies that have been represented in the Senate thanks to its proportionality. The Senate has been an ideas bank, the birthplace of much legislation and policy that has eventually been taken up by government. However, unfortunately, the Senate is often its own worst enemy when it comes to failing to use its powers it has been given to hold governments to account. Our research released today shows Australians are more likely to back the Senate than oppose it when the Senate faces off against the government. That should strengthen its will, and that would be good for our democracy too. Thank you very much. Ken, thank you, and thank you, Mr Bill, as well. Uh, thanks to both of you for your very interesting overview of your research and also for your perspectives on the role of the Senate and uh, its future capacity. Um, we've had a couple of questions sent through. I'll just give that email address again in case anyone would like to whip in with an additional question. The email address is research.sen 
at aph.gov.au. The first question we had sent through uh, touches on um, some of the comments that you made about the role of the Senate in being a state's house. The question is, as the Senate hasn't lived up to its purpose of being a state's house, should the Senate be abolished? And should the Parliament move to a unicameral system with multi-party electorates and propor proportional representation like the ACT Legislative Assembly? I think I could guess what your single word answer to that question would be, but um, would you care to answer that? Well, I'll have a go first. Mm. Uh, uh, and then Bill might like to uh, follow up. Now, I think a, a, a two a chamber system um, is important for lots of reasons. Uh, um, the Senate is obviously uh, elected on a different mandate and elected across a different time frame. Um, and, and that is a, is a check and a balance on a, on a house, however it's elected. Of course, if you were going to move to a, a single uh, house system, it would indeed need to be proportional, as your... Um, uh, emailer uh, suggests, uh, but it, it, it shouldn't be abolished. And I, and I think um, Bill might like to expand upon this. The notion that it is just a, a state's house is misguided. Um, and it's, of course, its proportionality has meant that it, it also doesn't operate just as a state's uh, house. It, um, allowing a, a diversity of voices in the chamber means it represents a diversity of, of interests across state boundaries. And I think that's uh, ultimately good, good for democracy. Yeah, thank you. I'll um, just add a, a few thoughts. Uh, the first, of course, is just that there's a big uh, constitutional hurdle to making any change to how the Senate operates so it would need to be taken into account. Um, the ACT, the, the case for kind of that lower house being the sole legislature, I think it's mostly about its size, not the lack of a need for one. And you can see that Tasmania, only a bit larger than the ACT, has kept and made good use of its upper house. They've kind of inverted the single member electorate model having that in the upper house, but they still have, a, have two bodies with separate modes of election. Um, so to the extent that the Senate doesn't serve only as a state's house uh, and never has. Uh, right back in Federation, they formed parties uh, and tended to vote on those lines. But to the extent that it's not a state's house, I think that um, it makes no case for its abolition, maybe some case for reform. Thank you. Uh, our next question is uh, an interesting one in terms of your research. Um, one of our audience members has asked, have the presenters undertaken any comparative research on the role of upper houses in non-English speaking federal jurisdictions such as Germany? Is there a tendency to focus on anglophone institutions when thinking about our parliamentary system? I don't know, Bill, do you want to start off? <laughs> um, yeah, we mostly looked at uh, Westminster style democracies and particularly the um, English speaking ones. Um, I think there should be lots to learn from other um, uh, countries, non-English speaking as well, but we haven't done much in that space already. I think Germany's upper house is a kind of state's house as well, but uh, maybe on a slightly different uh, electoral model. But it, it is a... Um, talking about this with Rachel before we um, went on air about um, really the, the potential importance in this work in longitudinal sense to see if attitudes to the Senate change over time is something we'd like to come back and look at. But I think uh, at a time when democracy is under a bit of pressure around the world, um, not just in, a, in Australia but in many places, I think uh, a, a better look at how upper houses in all types of systems are working to strengthen or weaken or invigorate or not democracy is important because uh, at the moment the the trend is globally, notwithstanding some ups and downs, um, a loss of faith and trust in democracy. And we're going to have to think of new ways if we want to halt that um, decline. Um, and I, I do think that upper houses elected with different mandates, um, sometimes uh, with less initial focus on them, are, 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 are places where different ways of doing democracy and, and engaging the public. Um, uh, are a good place to start. So good, good for the work there. Thank you, emailer. <laughs> um, 
Uh, I was wondering whether you might be able to uh, tell us a bit about your survey methodology. So your uh, lecture drew on two surveys. The first one was the survey you conducted, the primary one in uh, July of 2020 on the knowledge that Australians had of the Senate. And then your more recent polling of attitudes toward the Senate's use of powers. What surveys, do you, uh, tools do you use and uh, how do you select your participants? Bill is our uh, resident pollster and expert, so I, I won't dare to um, cross over anything he's got to say. Uh, yeah, so um, the original survey we did uh, on the Senate in the midst of 2020 um, was a, an online survey of 1,600 people, and that's done through an online panel provider. So they have a list of people who they send survey requests to um, across a whole range of issues. Um, pol you know, political and policy questions would be a, a tiny proportion, I imagine, of the surveys they conduct. They know enough about the people on their panel to make sure that they give us a representative sample of respondents. So that's by state and territory, by gender, and then by age group as well. Um, the Senate questions in that case were part of a, a longer survey, about 15 minutes long. So the Senate questions were only a portion of the total questions they were asked about. Um, and then uh, once you get that data back, you can weight it if there's any lack of representation there um, and then analyze the results. So uh, it's not a, an opt-in survey on a website where you might get a, a skewed response from people. It's um, going to a random selection of the population. Our, our polling is really done these days, mostly online polling is done, done this way. Mm. Uh, and the um, second poll from earlier this month, very similar, a shorter poll, a somewhat smaller sample, so 1,000 people instead of 1,600. Um, once you're at those levels, it actually doesn't make much of a difference to the margin of error. I think it might go from 2.5 to 3.5 or something. Mm two and a half to three and a half percent, something along those lines. Um, shorter poll, I think the Senate questions still weren't the only questions in the mix, but would have been a larger share of them and also representative. Um, and um, <clears throat> do, you, do you have a sense of um, how Australians' knowledge of the Senate compares with their knowledge about parliament in general and this uh, system of government in Australia? I think as someone who works in the parliamentary environment, I have to make sure I'm careful not to overestimate um, what, uh, what level of general knowledge that people do have about this context. Yeah, to the extent that we tested that general knowledge, it was mostly in those head-to-head -head comparisons, House of Representatives and the Senate, rather than a, a kind of overall test of people's familiarity with um, government as a whole and how it works. So that'd be another good follow-up study at some point. I mean, it might be interesting to, to learn um, if you had a, a survey that was specific about knowledge of the House of Representatives, for example, how that might compare. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, no doubt uh, knowledge of our parliamentary system is weaker than we would like overall, mm -hmm. and it won't just be about the Senate. Um, mm -hmm. Some of the things we, we tested about, or um, well, the colour, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. so there was about the same lack of knowledge of the colour in, in both chambers, that's for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, we might have time for a final question um, we've had put through from the audience. Would the presenters have any suggestions for how the Senate and its committees could provide different ways for the community to engage in its work? We, we um, have standard ways, I guess, for um, the public to engage with committees through public submissions and the hearing process. Um, I think we're looking for insights into novel or different ways to approach it. Well, I hope I'm not... A breach in confidence here, but on, on the way in here, I was um, told of an excellent new program that the Senate was uh, running to train um, and engage directly non not for profits in um, the workings and uh, understandings of the Senate, and in particular the uh, Senate committee system. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it can be kind of confronting for organisations and groups to uh, work their way through Senate processes and the mm -hmm. Senate committee system in particular. I think it's an excellent idea and I'm, I'm very keen for my organisation to engage with it um, in itself. Um, so uh, I do think that uh, the Senate's making some efforts to this lecture theories, uh, other things to engage uh, directly with the community. And, um, and the, Senate, the Senate committee process is really important. We, we've outlined you know, some of the aspects we think the Senate should 
muscle up a bit, and I think the committees would work stronger, like, like estimates did, if the Senate was more willing to back those committees in their powers and operations, and that would lead to further community engagement and further status for those committees. And um, I often reflect about um, the United States Senate committee system. There's, there's lots of wrong in United States politics, of course, but it's a cultural thing too. If you think about um, uh, witnesses appearing before Senate committees in the United States attempting to not answer a question fully from uh, a senator there, it just it just wouldn't happen. You know, they're under such much more pressure, and that's that's culture as well as law. And um, and in some ways, culture is the easiest and the hardest thing to change. You know, it doesn't take a law that needs to pass to change things, but it is is it is a cultural thing. And I think we need a cultural revolution in our democracy. And I think the Senate can be part of that. Uh, culture change and its committees can be, be part of that if, if they're backed up by a Senate willing to enforce its um, powers and, and status. Mm. Nothing to add. Yeah. Thank you. Um, well, thank you to Ben and uh, Bill for presenting today's lecture. Um, you did mention civics education in your concluding remarks and, and, and again just now. I did think the audience might be interested to know about the great work of our Parliamentary Education Office which is always hard at work educating students about parliament, including about the Senate and its important work. Last year, the PEO delivered programs to about 60,000 students, both here at Parliament House and virtually. And in fact, the pre-pandemic numbers are even higher, around 100,000 students uh, receive an education program from the Parliamentary Education Office each year. Um, and the excellent PEO website receives over 2 million hits per page, per hits of a unique page views. And that's a statistic from uh, 2020. And we do offer various adult education programs um, run by the PEO and also the departments of the Senate and the House of Representatives. And you weren't breaching any confidence. That is um, work that we uh, do do to provide training to various groups um, about various aspects of the work of the Senate, including its committee process. Um, and so your report and your presentation serves as a reminder about how important that educative work is that we do do here. So thank you. And finally, thank you to our audience for tuning in from far and wide, and particularly those who submitted some questions. Uh, a recording of this lecture and information about future lectures will be available on our website. And uh, um, uh, also, I just thought I'd mention again, um, Ben mentioned the rec there's a recording of the launch of the report by the former president, the Honourable Senator Ryan, on the Australian Institute's website. I'd encourage you to view that. There's some uh, great perspectives presented by the president about the work of the Senate and his role as president. Uh, now, our next lecture, if I may give a plug to that, is going to be presented on the 20th of May by Professor Cheryl Saunders. She's the Laureate Professor Emeritus at the University of Melbourne. And she will be speaking on the accountability of cross-jurisdictional bodies to the Australian Parliament. I hope you can join us then. Thank you once again to our presenters today, Bill and Ben. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us, Rachel. Thank you. Bye, everybody.